Now it's a pleasure to int briefly introduce Elena Jasnova to you, who is a member of the team which is working on a digital edition of uh, Der Stiel, which is the main work of uh, a German-born architect, Gottfried Semper. And uh, Gottfried Semper ranges amongst the most influential, most important architects of the 19th century, and his main work, Der Stiel, is one of the theoretical works on architecture. It's not basically only on architecture, it's, it's on, the, on the crafts and architecture being part of the crafts, um, which is one, uh, one of the most referenced uh, architectural theoretical books in history, I would say, at least from the, coming from the 19th century, it's also referenced from architects working today and also in, in, um, in scholarship. It's an extremely important uh, book and um, this project is um, uh, uh, is running now in the, th in, the, in the second four year phase funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and there is an entire team working on this. Um, I am doing this as a kind of responsible together with Philip Ursprung from the ETH. So it's a collaboration between ETH and UZI, Università della Svizzera Italiana. And Elena is the, uh, the, uh, the co-project leader in digital humanities. This is what we, how we labeled her, but I think it's right. Um, Elena got into the digital humanities with this project. Um, I got to know her when she was still an architecture student at ETH where she arrived after having done her bachelor in architecture in Cambridge, England. Um, and after her master in architecture, she joined my team doing her PhD thesis still on Gottfried Semper, Gottfried Semper's teaching in London. And this dissertation was completed in 2017, awarded with the Theodor Fischer Prize of the Central Institute for Kunstgeschichte, will be published next year, at the beginning of next year, a bit delayed due to Corona, like, like COVID. So thank you, Elena, who will introduce you into the project we are doing in the team. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia, and thank you very much to DHCH and to Peter and everyone who's been involved with the organization. It's a really great opportunity to be able to speak here about this project and to um, introduce uh, what we're doing. Um, uh, there are two things that need to be said before we begin. One thing is that, as uh, you already know, I come from, I'm an architect and an art historian by the first two trainings, and I've kind of had to grow into the digital humanities with this project. Um, but this also means that I'm coming to this material as both a researcher, so I've done my PhD on God, for example, and I know how uh, what this corpus means to somebody who is trying to ask scientific questions of it, of somebody who is trying to uh, get to do something with it, and I have a very specific interest in material culture that Zempel works with. But on the other hand, I also kind of become to be responsible uh, for making this project happen from the digital perspective. So there is a kind of balance uh, there where I get to look at it very much from two different uh, or maybe not such different angles. The second point is that what I'm about to present to you has been a project that's it's an ongoing project, but it's been very much a project that has had to uh, grow its, into its own given, very much given digital identity, and it had to think a lot on its feet. So a lot of the decisions that we've made uh, have been made from a very pragmatic perspective. This doesn't mean that we're not aware of the fact that there are broader, deeper, higher level implications, and we're very much keen to start thinking about these. And in that, uh, from that point of view, we also very much welcome comments, challenges, questions, and also proposals for collaboration uh, on any kind of level. So Sonia has already introduced Gottfried Zempfer very well. I'll just briefly say that if you, uh, uh, you might, if you come from Germany or the German speaking countries, you might have heard of Zempa because he's the architect of the Zempa Oper, which is a very uh, iconic building in Germany. Uh, if you've uh, studied art history at all, you might have heard of the so called argument about polychromy, about whether ancient uh, Greek uh, buildings or monuments had originally been painted or white. And that was something that Zempa was also heavily involved with uh, in the 19th century, and he was arguing that they were painted. And Zempa is also a theoretician of art, very, very famous for his art theory uh, that was published 
uh, in uh, 1860 and 1863 in a, a two-volume book called Simply the Style. Um, and uh, it's a very extensive, the style is a very extensive work. Uh, there is, by some estimation, you could say that practically all of Zempa's previous writing falls into the sort of preparatory work for the style. Uh, if we want to be a little bit more precise, perhaps we can say that he was working on it directly from, 19, uh, from 1843 onwards. So it's a book that has that was a product of a very long period of work, also a very varied period, because be, uh, within that period, he moved between three different locations, four, actually four even different locations. Uh, he started uh, this research in Dresden. Uh, he took part in the uprising. He had to move to Paris, then to London, then to Zurich, where he became a professor. Um, so it's uh, the evolution of the style and the way by which style came to be uh, reflects a very uh, long and complicated story that involves many different locations, many different people, books, and objects. And this is, uh, for me as a researcher, this is one of the most exciting things about the style, because it, this book is literally chock full of references to other things. And these other things are incredibly diverse. So some of these things are unique and some of these things are commonplace. So Zempa refers to works of art just as much as he refers to uh, commonplace textile artifacts that existed in his time. Um, some of these works come from scholarly, uh, some of these things come from scholarly context. So he refers to publications on archaeology that are actually still used today by archaeologists as references. But some of the other things that he talks about also come from uh, popular context. So he refers to things like illustrations from popular illustrated magazines of his time. Um, so it's a very, very diverse corpus, and this corpus also includes a full diversity of materials. So some of these things are copies, some of them are material artifacts, some of them are publications, some of them are print, uh, uh, print works, some of them are paintings, textiles, sculpture, and what may you, it's, it's literally a really, really great corpus of work that goes into this book. And I would argue, and I think there are many Zempa researchers who would support me in this out there, that understand, part of understanding the style is, um, uh, the crux of understanding the style is precisely in trying to understand something of this world in which this book came to be. And this brings me on to my, my kind of, um, uh, let's say the motto under which I've, I do this talk, and I've done, I've done it a couple of times in different constellations, also with colleagues. And this is a proposal by Sarah Mombert, published in Digital Critical Editions in 2014, where she calls for the development of new ways of tackling digital editing, not only as a more efficient means than a paper edition to report text genesis, but also as a possible recreating of the whole intellectual, cultural, and contemporary historical universe of the text's birth. So what she's getting at here is, of course, the fact that the digital environment gives us much broader possibilities than the book does. We can do things in the digital environment like embed media. Uh, we can include a much broader variety of images. We can give people ways to work with these images. You know, so, so everything that you've seen presented today and yesterday, that there these things basically are possibilities. They're possibilities that not only have to do with the world of the image, but very much with the study of texts. And there's a study of texts that we carry out as historians and very much as art historians, even though art historians say that they work with pictures um, or sculptures. Um, what I also find interesting about uh, Mombe's proposition is that she, uh, so she simultaneously uh, supports and challenges this kind of notion or this, uh, this idea that's, I think, become quite widespread in digital humanities in the past couple of years, this notion of moving away from text, moving away from text, uh, using DH to do things that are not textual and so on. Because on the one hand, she precisely points out that uh, the study of text is not just text, the crux of the study. any kind of radical 
anti-textuality. So she's not saying that we should throw text out, rather she's saying that we should find new ways of working with it that embrace the possibilities of the digital. Um, and this is, um, as you can see, this, uh, this call, this, this idea has been published by now quite a long time ago, a very long time ago for a field that's involved with digital technologies because it, these fields tend to be very, uh, they tend to evolve very, very fast. Um, yet, I would say that this is still very much a vision. So I personally, I don't know a digital edition that would have done this successfully or that would have achieved this. But I think this is an aspiration that many out there would share. And it's certainly an aspiration on our project. And I will talk towards the end of my talk about how we are hoping to try and achieve it in some ways. So Sonia already has done a great job of introducing the Zempur edition, the edition is an SNSF funded uh, three phase, it's proposed to be as a three phase project with each phase uh, running for four years, the the funding for the fourth, uh, third phase, sorry, is still outstanding, of course, so at the moment we are in the first year of the second phase, so we've been working on this for four and a half years so far. The edition um, is planned to cover around 10,000 pages of manuscript and over 5,000 pages of print. So we have a lot of material, even for, you know, by the measure of this uh, pretty extensive period, we have a lot of material. Currently, we have four senior employees and uh, two students, student assistants and one um, uh, like civil dienst assistant. So he's, he's doing his civil service, uh, who's just started this week. Um, and it's a cooperation between the USI and the ETH. As Sonia has already just mentioned, our materials are mainly stored at the GTA archives. So the GTA archives are, of course, our key partner in uh, this project. Um, but we also have materials for the field. There is some at the ETH library, primarily print works. Um, we have a very important manuscript coming from the Braunschweig library. And there are also some manuscripts in private collections and there are other materials you know, materials belonging to that historical life world of this project that are to be found in museums and libraries across Europe and North America and probably if we wanted to go further, I would say probably across the world. Um, the IT development for this project is done by the uh, scientific information services of the ETH Zurich, so the funky technical stuff that I will show you a little bit later uh, is very much their work, specifically work of Sven Vermoll, with whom we published a paper on this project last year. Um, the graphic design, um, again, of our great funky website is done by two uh, graphic designers called Nadine Butrich and uh, Reinhard Schmidt. And finally, our linked uh, data cooperation, uh, our linked data aspect will be taking place via a cooperation uh, with uh, GTA Digital and Sari, uh, which I'm sure many of you have also met elsewhere. In terms of content, uh, so what you see here is that the first um, a uh, uh, light gray column of this chart is what we've already done. So this is manuscripts uh, relating to the first volume of the style, uh, plus uh, most of the print material that we are dealing with. So some of it is already complete, some of it is nearly complete and so on. What we're doing at the moment is the material relating to the second volume and the uh, the Kunstformen layer. So this is this important Braunschweig manuscript that has been rediscovered, uh, I think about 15 years ago, um, and that we're digitizing and transcribing. And the third phase that is planned would cover Zemper's teaching materials, materials that relate to something that he had suggested during his life as the third volume of the style, but never quite formulated concretely in that sense. And some of the manuscripts, uh, some of the no uh, manuscript notes of his students in his lectures at the ETH. The corpus that we work with is uh, pretty heterogeneous. So uh, we have um, manuscripts in Zemper's own hand. And what I'm showing you here is not too sheets put together this is a spread a real spread from the manu from a long manuscript uh, so you see uh, what kind of things we're dealing with so he recycled bits of paper a lot he would write on one side of the paper and then on the other side you would see something turned over and crossed out and that would be part of an earlier draft from somewhere else in the manuscript he did a lot of corrections 
Um, some manuscripts uh, run over uh, 100, 200 pages and constitute a continuous text. Uh, there are other manuscripts that kind of constellation. Uh, so these manuscripts have varying, uh, varying levels of complexity. Uh, we also have so-called fair copies, so these are calligraphically written manuscripts, um, sorry, the, all the manuscripts are written in German current, um, so the uh, ones in Zempa's own hand are written kind of how he would normally write for himself, and the fair copies are written in the calligraphic hand, either by members of Zempa's family or by um, uh, the then secretary of the ETH who copied them out calligraphically. Uh, the interesting thing is that the fair copies and the manuscripts do not have a very straightforward relationship to the book because we know for sure that at least parts of the book were not actually set from the fair copies, they were set from the manuscripts. So we cannot say, okay, he wrote the manuscript and then there was the fair copy and then there was the proof, which we also have. Rather, the relationship is quite complex and the evolution is not linear. Uh, in addition to this, uh, in the proof stage, Zempo also hand didn't have necessarily recognized some of the words that he uses so there's a really interesting social history of how print is produced happening in this corpus and there is in addition a lot of notes that Zempa adds to uh, to the book even in the proof stage the style is uh, heavily illustrated and uh, there is really a lot of pictures um, that you see in the published book and I've just seen that my next image has been corrupted. This, I apologize, this sometimes happens with my PowerPoint. I was going to show you the same things that you see appearing here, appearing as drawings in the Zempa archive, but you would just have to believe me. There are sketches for many of these things in the Zempa archive. Um, there are also, uh, in the case of many of the illustrations, he simply copied them from other books. So he used tracing paper where he just traced them and then transformed them into uh, cliches for printing. Uh, so the images themselves have contained a really interesting uh, history, a really interesting story that tells us a lot about Zempa's network. Uh, in addition, we also have different copies of uh, the um, uh, the actual is resulting book. There were two editions that were published in the 19th century. Uh, and within the first edition, there are also uh, different variations between different copies. So we are digitizing and processing several copies to give researchers a possibility to deal with these and try to identify what, how did they come about, what did they mean, and so on. Um, there is a further a field within this corpus. There are also um, the objects that add to the complexity of this edition. So, for example, this is a photograph that is in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum, and this was a photograph made, uh, an early photograph made for an exhibition of furniture that the um, uh, back then Department of Science and Art held uh, in London in 1853. And Zempa has specifically, when he was publishing the books, the, the book had specifically requested this photo and several others in order to use them as illustrations in the book. And uh, we also have letters about this and so on. But the original of the photo exists. So this is, this is again part of this extended network of the life world of this text. Uh, we also have uh, a whole range of extant objects that Zempa talks about in his text. So this is one example uh, that I've included here that I briefly looked at during my PhD. And I've, I've put it in here to show you, you know, that we're really dealing here with museum objects. There, there are museum objects that exist out there in museums. There's a lot of the v &A, there's a lot of the British Museum and so on. So the kind of evolutionary, the, the, the life world of this text, the way it has come about really includes things that are out there that exist in the physical world. In addition to this, there is also a, a very broad corpus of publications that Zempa refers to. Um, 
uh, as I said, some of them scholarly, some of them less scholarly, many of them by now digitized. So again, there is a great potential to link this edition to provide researchers with an infrastructure that really takes them further than just a text on a page. Um, so all of these things contribute to this kind of very rich network within which this uh, edition exists. Um, now, I will uh, briefly speak about our workflow uh, on this edition, so this will be a bit that covers text and until now in our work we've been largely covering text we're just starting to get to the point where. Um, uh, we are starting to be able to kind of get out into this wider network of things references linked data uh, that uh, that this text kind of properly deserves. So I will, I will very briefly cover just the kind of text part of the edition because we're doing some interesting things, things there as well. So as I said, the edition's material is extremely heterogeneous, so that's why you see this kind of complicated flowchart here, because different materials uh, require different kind of treatment. So we start, the uh, digitizing is done for us by the GTA archives and the um, various contractors that they use for this, so this is something that we do not deal with directly, we receive the images from them, and we start by um, establishing where the text is on the Um, it was actually through Tobias that I kind of met Transcribus, and Transcribus, uh, as you know, offers this possibility of uh, using a, some degree of automatic recognition in different stages of working with manuscripts, and this is extremely useful for us because we have, um, well, simply put, we have a very large volume of material, even in the time and resources that we have, this is actually a very challenging amount of stuff to deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to have time left to do all the other interesting things. Um, and so Transcribus gives us various uh, tools with which we can, uh, we can work to make things a little bit faster. Uh, one tool is the possibility of using automated uh, layout analysis. So this is something that uh, gives us text regions, which we then adjust uh, according to our uh, standards. Uh, another um, uh, another possibility that we have is of using actual handwritten text recognition. Uh, so this is something that works in the fair copies very well. So fair copies we have largely processed in Transcribus where we've uh, used HDR uh, and then just corrected it and then export, uh, tagged it and exported it and then processed it further in, um, in XML. We have also created a Zemper model uh, in HDR and the Zempa model in and of itself is quite good, uh, but we find that because of the complexity of the pages that we have, it doesn't end up saving us a lot of time to use it on a lot of the manuscript that's, uh, manuscripts that we have, but on some of the manuscripts, so on the ones that are written uh, kind of a little bit more neatly in a slightly more ordered fashion, um, uh, it is possible to use HDR and we do use HDR for the Zempa's own um, uh, for working with Zempa's own handwriting. Um, for these manuscripts where we can apply HDR, we further process it in Transcribus, so we tag it uh, and we, we correct the transcription. We also use the possibilities of Transcribus for uh, um, processing the proofs. So here, uh, because Transcribus comes with a, uh, a printed text recognition um, uh, technology as well as uh, with uh, possibilities for you for doing handwritten text so uh, we use that uh, and then again we process it it's read through it is corrected but then the uh, um, various remarks and notes that Zempa does here are uh, transcribed by hand um, uh, and uh, this is actually a work that um, uh, that's pretty advanced then uh, we come to the point where all of the things get exported to TI, so manuscripts that are transcribed in XML get exported pretty early on after layout analysis, other things a little bit later on. And we export it to XML TI, and uh, what is XML TI? So I'm not entirely sure who has already met TI in this room, who hasn't, so if you have, 
you can go and check your email or something. Um, but uh, uh, so TIXML is a standard. TI stands for the Text Encoding Initiative. And this is an initiative that goes, I think, in its original form all the way back to the late 1980s. Um, and the idea was to develop a standard for digital representation of scholarly texts. And the uh, format that was picked for TI was XML, and XML stands for the Extensible Markup Language. And the way XML works is that you have elements. So I've highlighted here three elements for you, a paragraph element, a delete element, and a highlight element. And elements come with two tags, a start tag and an end tag that has a slash. Elements can have attributes. So here, this is what you see written as rent in inverted commas unterstrichen um, and uh, uh, elements can sit within each other so you can have elements following other elements you can also have so-called uh, empty elements or milestones that just mark a point in the text for whichever reason um, and uh, this is the example i'm showing you here is specifically ti xml but the xml is very common you've seen plenty of xml today and yesterday um, and if you have any application on your computer that deals with text and quite a lot of the ones that deal with images, chances are it has some kind of XML behind it somewhere. Um, so there are many, many different types of XML. So it's a very, very common technology. Uh, and so a complete manuscript uh, transcribed in our XML looks like this. So this is an example that shows you the manuscript page and the transcription of the document. Um, uh, the, uh, there are several problems with, the, uh, with uh, TI XML specifically and with XML more generally. The most uh, prominent one is the so-called overlap problem. So if you have an overlap of two phenomena that you want to transcribe, as you often do in real world texts. So for example, here is an underlining and a deletion. Um, you know, you, intuitively, you would want to transcribe it like this. Except in XML, you could, you absolutely cannot do that. This breaks it. So XML has to be strictly hierarchical. You cannot have two elements that overlap. So if you have something like this happening, you need to split up one of the elements. Or there is also a more um, involved technical solution where you can do something called standoff markup, where you save some of the markup in a separate file. Uh, but this brings uh, with, uh, with it its own uh, problems and challenges. So TI XML has advantages and disadvantages. The main advantages are um, readability. So you can open a, uh, an XML transcription and just read it uh, with more or less difficulty. So it's, you know, it's readable as is. It doesn't require any kind of conversion. Uh, it's readable for humans, obviously. Um, the other is sustainability. XML is really just text. There is nothing else in there. So you know, if you wanted to archive this forever and ever, it would be relatively straightforward to do. Uh, you know, to be ridiculous, uh, like at a push, you could even just print it out uh, because it, it really is just text. Uh, obviously, nobody would want to do that, but you know, just for the sake of argument, it is incredibly sustainable uh, in that res in you know in that respect. Uh, it's uh, it is very very widespread. Obviously, as I said, XML is everywhere. Um, and it's pretty easy to learn. Now, I know there's a, there's a lot of people who come to kind of digital editing or digital transcription and they feel very frightened by the quantity of the pointy brackets there. It's really not that scary. Um, it's, it's very straightforward. It's conceptually not very difficult. It's incredibly easy to learn. And there's a massive community for TI XML. So because TI has been around for such a long time, there's a lot of people who use it. There is great support. Uh, the TI handbook is fantastic, so it's really a very, uh, a very supportive environment. It has, however, several disadvantages. So one of them I have already showed you, the hierarchical structure that does not allow you to have overlaps, and that produces these various um, solutions that make it ultimately actually less readable, so they eat away at some of the advantages of, uh, of TI XML. The other is low level of standardization. Uh, so TI as a standard is gigantic. You can transcribe anything in TI. There's a module for transcribing music. There's one for poetry. There's one for drama. Uh, there is uh, one for dictionaries and so on. So it's really a gigantic thing that tries to enable transcription of any kind of scholarly text. 
And even if you look at TI transcriptions of quite similar manuscripts from similar periods, you can see you would see very, very differently structured TI transcriptions. Uh, so this means that there's a very low level of standardization. So as soon as you try to develop any kind of product for this, like a um, a publisher application that would simply interoperable. It's not interoperable even by the standards of Web 2, let alone by the standards of semantic web. And if you look at this transcription here, you can kind of begin to see what you know what I'm talking about. So it's readable, and yes, you can sort of read the text here, but at the same time, there are also all these other things knocking about there, which you know some of them are obviously meaningful, such as Dell. Okay, something's been deleted, but then there are also these things called XML ID. There are these things called target, and so on. So there's there's a lot of stuff happening there that is not for human readability. So you know this whole argument of it's like you know, it's just text, it's human readable, and so on, it, it kind of begins to fall away. Uh, so this is where the uh, right hand side of this diagram comes in. And this is why our edition uses a two pronged approach. On the one hand, yes, we produce our transcriptions in uh, TA, uh, TI XML for all the reasons that I have mentioned, it's easy to use, it's commonplace, and so on, it's easily preserved, archivable. Um, on the other hand, it also has a lot of uh, functional um, limitations. Uh, and so for this reason, we've decided as well as transcribing the documents in XML to establish a graph database that would actually save the entirety of the text in the form of graph data. What is graph data? Graph data has been mentioned a couple of times already. Uh, so um, in uh, a conventional database, you have things stored in tables. Uh, kind of a little bit like in uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and one weakness of conventional databases is that they're not very good at processing a lot of connections. So at some point, there's just too many connections and the whole thing breaks. So this was one of the reasons why graph databases were developed, because in graph databases, data is stored in the form of nodes and relations. So you have some kind of points and uh, whether it's a line or an arrow depends a little bit on what type of graph database you use. Um, but you basically have nodes and relationships between nodes and graph databases are very good at processing connections and links. And of course, the moment I mentioned the word connections and links, we think back to uh, our nice Zempa corpus that has so many different connections uh, that it just seems to be a very good match technologically. Uh, we use a uh, technology for our graph data called uh, Neo4j. Neo4j is an open source application that's become very popular in the scholarly community in the past couple of years, partic in particular linguists and uh, people who do various kinds of discourse analysis have been doing really cool things with Neo4j. Um, and um, we use in an approach, again, that comes out of the DH work of the past few years, referred to as text as graph. So what happens in text as graph is that text is stored as chains of nodes and relations in the graph data format. And nodes represent, in our case, uh, words, parts of words, or punctuation marks. So we take our XML and we import it into the uh, into the uh, graph database and each um, um, depending on and I'll talk about the import in a minute uh, and uh, they end up uh, the, the nodes end up being words or parts of words or punctuation marks and nodes and this is specific again to Neo4j nodes can have properties and labels so for example a node can have a property denoting its script whether it's written in current in Latin or in Greek. Um, it can have a part of speech tag denoting whether it's a noun and a verb or a verb and so on. And nodes are linked together in uh, to represent direction of text flow. So in Neo4j, the links, the relations are directional. They, uh, they point to a thing. So here you see a sequence of nodes uh, linked together with uh, relations that uh, are labeled next. So this relation denotes the next word. So you have this is the flow, a string of uh, four tokens in this case. 
Um, there, are all, uh, there are also in our graph database other types of nodes, nodes that represent line breaks, uh, paragraphs, and pages. There are also nodes that represent some of the information that is included normally in the header of the TI document, so that's things like document, um, archival metadata or uh, material object description and so on. Um, and re uh, relations can also be used to link nodes to relevant index entries. So for example, if there is a word layered appearing in the text, uh, um, Zempa means with that Austin Henry Laird, who was a British archeologist and diplomat um, who was excavating in, uh, who excavated uh, in the vicinity of Mosul. So he, he dug up near, or he initiated the excavation of Neo-Assyrian artifacts. Um, and uh, Zempa refers to him quite a lot because Assyrian artifacts are very important to him. So when we get a node saying layered, we can draw a relation to uh, an index node for Austin Henry Layard uh, that has various information attached. And that can also importantly be linked to external resources. So all of these nodes and relations, they are very, very linkable. So it becomes very easy to bring in external information. Or another good example would be, so you've just seen um, a real online uh, project that Sonia Gasser had shown, and I know that real online used the same technology as us, they also use Neo4j, and Zempa mentions a lot of medieval artifacts, so for example, one thing we could probably do, and that we'll probably try and do, is uh, get in touch with them and, and see if we can get our two databases to talk to each other. Um, one important thing about the specific way in which we are doing text as graph is that in our case, the text is um, just one chain. So we're not representing deletions or additions as alternative path in the text. So if you look at a page of text uh, in our uh, graph database, you will just see one continuous line. If you're familiar with text as graph, you would know that there are some other people who have been trying to do it, but then they would, for each deletion, for example, and addition or, uh, or transposition, they would create alternative paths in uh, the graph database. Uh, one problem with this is that it becomes very difficult to query. The other problem is that the text representation that it ends up with, and this is kind of our argument, uh, um, is quite static. So each alternative pass is essentially somebody's interpretation of this is a separate representation of this text. And this has been in recent years, not the direction in which the uh, scholarly editing community has been going. The direction has been more uh, towards trying to understand texts as fundamentally dynamic, fundamentally not fixed in their form. Um, and we feel that our representation of the whole text as a chain of tokens that represent words with specific labels where, you know, if a word has been um, deleted, we, it just has a label saying that it's been deleted, but it, is, it does not move into a separate path. We feel that this is closer to the paradigm of the open dynamic text. So how do our TIs end up, uh, our TI XMLs end up in the graph database? For this, uh, the uh, clever programmer uh, that we work with has written a special import script. This is a Python script that's been published. So if anybody out there is interested in using it, please give it a try and get in touch with us and tell us what you think. Um, it's called TI to, uh, to Neo. And this is basically an XML parser that splits up the XML into data units, so it identifies where things are, where is an element, where is a space, where is a word, and so on. Um, and then we use a, a product called Spacey, uh, which is an algorithm that does multiple things. So what it does for us is tokenize uh, the text into tokens and enrich it with some information. So when I mentioned that we have labels saying whether th something is a verb or something is a noun and so on, this information comes from Spacey. Um, so parser processes not only, um, you know, it not, doesn't, uh, doesn't only split up the XML, but it also processes impl uh, implications of some elements. So there are some elements in uh, the XML that only affect what's in, in between the tags, and then there are the so-called milestone or empty elements that affect everything that comes after that tag up until a certain point in, in further on in the text. So the parser also um, uh, deals uh, with the implications of these two different types of elements. 
Um, and the tokens are then stored as nodes using the uh, Python Neo library. Um, and when we end up with words split by line breaks, so half of a word is before a line break and there is a hyphen in between, uh, these then, then get concatenated and stored as alternative nodes. So this is the only uh, kind of alternative path element that we have in, in our uh, text chain. Uh, line breaks, par so lines, paragraphs, and pages also become connected. So the chain, uh, the text is a continuous thing. Uh, and paragraphs that's, that are split over two pages also become connected. Uh, and paragraphs are linked into the corresponding zones in the facsimile. So that uh, we can then represent uh, the, uh, um, the transcriptions on our nice little web page that looks like this. And now I'm going to. Um, do a little bit of showing off and I would like to show you how do I best do this I would like to show you our web page but I'm not going to show you the online version which you can go and consult if you like under this address uh, you will get a certificate warning and I'm very sorry about this this is an issue that we will resolve in a couple of weeks for the moment just click it away there is nothing dangerous on there that will break your computer um, So I'm just going to stop this for a second. How do I stop it? Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a development version that's, uh, you know, it's in pretty good shape. I think we'll probably take this one online um, in um, a couple of months. Um, the important difference between the version that's online at the moment and this one is that this one actually runs off the graph database. So everything you see being queried there is coming from uh, the uh, transcription stored in our graph database. Uh, and as you can see here, we can load, for example, the first page. Uh, and it's, as you can see, the speed is uh, reasonable. It's running over my mobile connection, which uh, because for some reason the Wi-Fi doesn't work for me here. Um, uh, as you can see, the transcription gets displayed side by side. Uh, there is uh, also a highlighting function so that the user can see which manuscript elements correspond to which uh, elements of the transcription. Uh, you can uh, uh, go and switch to a different uh, uh, different document directly from here. You also have the option of switching the text representation, so the so-called laser fasting, which is the, um, you know, so the transcript is a text uh, showing you uh, where the line breaks are, showing you where various uh, deletions are and so on. The uh, reading version is just a text in case that somebody just wants to read the content of the text. You can switch this uh, into a comparison view, so this is Zemper's a uh, fair copy text of uh, the section on China and one could, for example, go and open the proof of the section on China. Uh, that is taking a little while to load, but as I said, it is a development, uh, a development version. Let's try maybe a Druk variant that might load better. Yeah. And if you like, you could compare the, the finally published text uh, with what was written in the fair copy. So this is very, very much the idea to give users this possibility of comparing different versions and different, uh, um, different, uh, different manuscripts, different print, uh, print versions, and so on. Uh, in addition, so we can go back to the facsimile for this page. In addition, we also have the uh, what we call the Stellen Kommentar at the moment. So these uh, these thing uh, these entries here is uh, what we have entered into our indices or into what we are calling register, um, and. Uh, 
they are at the moment only they only exist internally as data but this is this the current stage of work that i am just coming to and i'm going to switch back to my slides so you know it's all very well for text uh, and it's all looking very nice and so on but you say to me elena but what about all that world of nice things that you talked about in the beginning uh, and uh, as I said, this is something that we are starting to work with actively uh, now. So throughout the transcription process, we have been tagging specific things in the text and we've been uh, establishing a kind of basic level of normalization by running index files or so-called index files in the sense of lists of uh, normalized entries linked with IDs to our transcriptions for on the one hand pretty standard things like persons places publications and organizations but on the other hand for things that are a bit more specific to us and a little bit more complicated so a big part of this is artifacts uh, but also theoretical terms because we're working here with a work of art theory and what i've described here as specific terms so one example of this are the words the Zempa uses to describe ethno-national groups in the 19th century sense. So what in German would be described as Volker, uh, the best contemporary translation in English would have been races back then, but the two terms had very different historical evolutions. So nowadays it would be a bit of a misrepresentation if we said races on as the title of this list. Um, we have an ongoing discussion about what we're going to call it, uh, but these, um, you know, we have to uh, represent these terms because they form a very important part of this life world in which Zempus text was um, created, an intellectual life world with very, very specific assumptions about identities of people and things. Uh, so we have just started this work, and this is where we have an ongoing cooperation with GTA Digital and SARI, uh, and at the moment we are building a SCOS thesaurus for the theoretical terms and for um, material things that Zempa speaks about in the general sense, so things like materials, so for example when he talks about silk, or when he talks about specific embroidery techniques, we do not enter this into an artifact, um, uh thesaurus we enter this into a scos thesaurus we're creating this through a platform called uh iqvoc or equoc i'm not sure how one's supposed to refer to it in speech uh, but this is a setup that uh, the gta digital people have provided for and that we will publish alongside also um, a linked data for other uh, things that have a more of an existing um, more of an existing linked data environment so for things like persons and places uh, these will be linked then externally to things like the GND and the uh, Getty art and architecture tesoros those of you who are familiar with ATT might be seeing here that there is already a little bit of a reflection of the ATT so we're trying to align um, our categories or our hierarchies to some extent with the ATT to improve discoverability um, and uh, this is where that work is and we're really um, excited about the future because at the moment obviously we're working on still fairly conceptual things i think once we start getting out into artifacts that will become really interesting because we'll be at the point where we'll start contacting museums and saying hey can we how can we link this in what ways can we link it can we create some kind of data exchange and so on so it will be really a point where we could get this network to begin All the other members of the edition team that's been going on for four and a half years uh, it's still on the on the time uh, restrictions from the Zeitschrift for Schweizer Social Archaeology because it's two years but if you want a copy just send me an email um, and thank you very much for your attention